We welcome you to the Ed Seventh-day Adventist Church, where our focus is on learning and not on entertaining. Thank you that you could make it here with us once again on this beautiful, uh, cool Sabbath day. We are glad that you could join us. We are so happy that you decided to come and see us, and even if you decide to come and see us later, we're still very happy, very excited. You are part of our group, of our church, of our family, and we delight when we realize that many of you make it a point to come and visit us uh, Sabbath after Sabbath in spite of the distancing. For those of you who are wondering when we will go back to church, we are planning on going back soon. I cannot give you a definite date because we are still working on acquiring a few uh, things that we need uh, in order to be able to open. And those are still on the way, but are almost, almost here. Uh, we already worked on the seating arrangement and that is looking very good. The church is completely clean and ready to be occupied once again. But you will be receiving some guidelines from us to you. Some guidelines that will uh, be required. It's not going to be an option. It's something that if we want to go back to church, we are going to have to uh, have some uh, measures in place. Things will not be the same as far as sitting, as far as how we uh, went around doing our church business. However, we will be able to be together and fellowship in the same room, and that will be a blessing. Once again, thank you for joining us this morning here at the Ed Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today, we are doing part two of our series on uh, the belief, Seventh-day Adventist belief, uh, number 12, the church. If you missed Wednesday's presentation, I encourage you to look it up here on Facebook or go to our YouTube page and look it up so that you will have the whole picture together. Let us pray before we begin. Our Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come once again and study your word. Every time that we open the Bible, we are blessed, and especially if we ask for your presence and your leading, which we are doing this morning. I thank you for each and every one of those who have decided to come and uh, make time for you on your holy day. Father, we desire to hear your voice. Please. Uh, may Jesus Christ be lifted up, may he be seen and heard, and may we be able to praise your name together, uh, realizing at the end that you were with us and that you guided us. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray, amen. So let us get started. We are going to do that by going to the book of Exodus chapter 17. Once again, we are, we are studying about the church, and today's message is titled, One Foundation, uh, Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. And I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible. It reads like this. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journey by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted, and there was, the people thirsted, there was water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with 
to this people a little more and they will stone me. The Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. I know what you're thinking. We're talking about the church and one foundation. And what does this have to do with anything? And uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, it has a lot to do with it. And we're going to draw from here two different lessons. But before we get there, let me ask you. A question who was it that delivered Israel from captivity from slavery in Egypt and who was it that was leading them through the wilderness you are absolutely right it was the Lord God the one who delivered them it was the Lord God the one who parted the sea so that they could walk on dry land it was the same God who uh, allowed the waters to recede and to uh, trap Pharaoh and his army and drowned them completely in the eyes of Israel. It was the same God who was leading them apparently in this barren land with, with no water where they thirsted and yet they s seem to have forgotten all about that. Like I said there's two lessons that I think are important. The first one is a practical lesson and that is that the Lord sometimes leads us through a dry, barren, and thirsty ground. Sometimes the Lord will lead you through places uh, where you're going to thirst, where you are going to suffer, where you are going to cry, where things are not going to be easy, where, where cir circumstances will be adverse to the point that you are going to feel like you are alone, like the Lord has deserted you, like you are lost, like nothing is working out. You are going to be afraid. Perhaps you're going to be thirsting uh, physically or spiritually. And, and the Lord uh, does this not because he delights in watching us suffer while he drinks his ice cold lemonade from heaven and watching you know watching us uh, suffer and thirst no he does this because he wants to to uh, he wants us to learn something and this something that he wants us to learn or to realize because we often forget it uh, we find it in in the gospel of john go with me to the gospel of john chapter 6 And Jesus here tells us what that is. John chapter 6 and verse 35. Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus is the solution for our hungering and for our thirsting. You see, all along Israel had the solution in their midst. It was the same God who delivered them, who opened the sea. It was the same God who, who uh, defeated their enemies, who were persecuting them. The same God who had everything in his hands to give them wa water to drink. And yet they concentrated on the problem instead of concentrating on the solution. They, they, tried, they tried to find a scapegoat in, in Moses. As if Moses was the one who had, by his own power, uh, through his own decision and planning, brought them out of Egypt. Moses was simply an instrument in the Lord's hands. But it was the Lord all along who was doing all the work. It was the Lord who all along had brought them out of Egypt, who had provided for them, and who was more than willing to continue to provide. But he wanted Israel to learn this 
this very important lesson that when you run into trouble, do not concentrate on the problem, but uh, seek for the solution upwards where God is. Go to Him in prayer. Talk to Him when you are feeling thirsty, be it spiritual thirst or physical thirst. Talk to Him because He has your best interest in mind. But there's also a spiritual lesson that we can draw from this. And the spiritual lesson is that Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock from whence the cool waters flow, from where this living waters come from. He, he is that rock. He, he has what we need. Uh, listen to this. If we skip a few chapters here. Uh, chapter 7 and verse 37 and 38 he tells us that John 7 37 and 38 it reads like this now on the last day the great day of the feast Jesus stood and cried out saying if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink he who believes in me as the scripture said from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And of course, he was talking about the living water of the Holy Spirit that comes into our hearts when we accept Christ, when we are baptized. And after that, we become streams of living waters for others who are thirsty all around us. But Jesus, Jesus is the rock. Jesus, that rock that, that Moses was to to strike the first time was a, a sure representation of Jesus Christ, a sure representation of how Jesus was going to be struck for us on the cross of Calvary and how through his uh, death we would be able to receive this gift of living waters. And how, you know, how from now on we don't have to strike the rock, we simply have to ask. Him for help. We simply have to approach the throne of grace believing that He cares for us, that He He has our best interests in mind, that He loves us, and that, that He delights in giving His children what they request. Jesus is the rock. He is our sure foundation. Just like Him, uh, 348 of the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, reads uh, the church has one foundation it is Jesus Christ her Lord and this is a point that I want us to to concentrate on this is the the lesson that I want us to concentrate on because we are talking about the church and and most importantly we need to understand and we need to dissipate any doubt out there because you will run into some people who will have other opinions as to who is this sure foundation and so for that is that we are going to concentrate our efforts on this second lesson Jesus Christ as the rock as the cornerstone as the foundation meaning as the sure ground where the building is built so let's go together to the book of Isaiah it's important for us to begin in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. Isaiah 28 verse 16. And it reads like this, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly plant firmly placed but listen to this he's talking about a stone but listen to what he says he who believes in it in other words he who believes in the stone this this uh this uh tested stone this costly cornerstone he who believes in the stone uh depending on what translation you have either you will not be disturbed or you will not move around hastily. Uh, 
In other words, you are not going to be disturbed. You are not going to be distraught. You are not going to be looking around you for for a sure foundation because it's going to be under you. And so this is a messianic prophecy. It says that the Lord God says, Behold, I am laying in Zion and the city of God a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone uh, for the foundation firmly placed. And it talks about this stone uh, not being a thing or an object, but a person in which whom we can believe in. Now, with that in mind, let's go to the New Testament, to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. I wanted us to have that as our foundation, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, so that we can uh, stand firm. So many puns that you can come up with. So you can stand firm because when you get to difficult texts, if you have been reading the uh, Sabbath School Quarterly, which I recommend all of you to read because that is what makes us Seventh-day Adventists. That is what unites us with the rest of the world, the world church. Uh, if you have been reading the Sabbath School Quarterly for this week, we were talking about difficult texts. And this is one of those difficult texts that some people read it and or they just want to skip it they don't want to talk about it they come up with all kinds of weird explanations for it and there's disagreement between Christians as to what it means but it's important for us not to uh, hide our our faces or our heads from difficult texts difficult texts are there uh, but that doesn't mean that the Bible contradicts itself Never does the Bible contradict itself, no matter what anyone tells you. Because if the Bible contradicted itself, it wouldn't be the sure word of God. God is perfect. He doesn't contradict himself. Then there has to be another explanation. There has to be a way to understand difficult texts. And the way to understand difficult texts is by comparing Scripture with Scripture. It's by going to the source. It's not by going to other external sources. It's first of all to go to the Bible itself. So let's read this uh, difficult text here in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13. We're going to begin in 13 and go all the way to 18 because we want to have the context. It's important always to, especially with difficult texts, to have the context of what is happening. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea of Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you Simon Barjona or son of John, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now Peter has just made the great confession, the great confession that all Christians at one point or another have to make. This is what gets you to be a Christian. You have to make this great confession. And the great confession is you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are not just a man. You are not just a good teacher. Uh, you know, you are not just a prophet. You are the Christ, the Son of of the living God and because he was the one that answered his question uh, some people think that that Jesus is seemingly telling Peter that he was the rock upon which he would build his church that's where the difficulty comes in a lot of people say well you see Peter was uh, the the first bishop or he he was the foundation, he was to be the foundation 
of the church. He was to be the cornerstone of the church. It's upon Peter that the church is built upon. Now it's important for us to keep this in mind because uh, because we need to ask the Bible some questions. It's important for us to ask the Bible some questions. The first question is, is this accurate? Is this an accurate portrayal of Peter? Did Peter understand this himself? Uh, or did Peter understand this about himself? Did he think that he was the rock? Did he act as he was the rock upon which the church was built? And so we need to allow the, the Bible to interpret itself. Now, of course, we don't have hours upon hours to uh, expound on all of the different passages of Scripture. So we are going to just go to a, a few of them. Go with me. First of all, we are going to ask uh, the Apostle Paul to clarify a little bit. And we're going to Ephesians in chapter 2. Ephesians is after Galatians chapter 2 and verses 20 through 22. I chose this verse because this one also uh, causes a little friction with some people, some Adventists. And I like those, I actually like those verses that are a little uncomfortable because they make us think and we have to. We have to reason through them. We have to find an explanation for them. Uh, we should never be like, oh, I don't know, and just don't read it. You know, skip that part of scripture. That's not the answer. And you're never going to convince anyone by saying that. And so it's important. That friction, I find it very, very interesting, very important for me because it, it pushes me to study. And I hope uh, it does the same for you. Well, here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul says the following, which almost seems to, you know, go with what Jesus had said in Matthew. It says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. In other words, he is making it sound like we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So if you completely discard the fact that that Jesus, you know, meant to say that that uh, he was going to build his church upon the foundation, and part of the foundation was the apostles, those whom he called, then you have a problem when you come to Ephesians two twenty because Paul seems to be talking about the fact that a foundation is built upon the prophets and the apostles. Um, thankfully, he doesn't just end the chapter there and then leave us hanging and leave us even more confused than when we started. He continues, and praise the Lord that he continues to expound. He says, I'm going to read it again. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being what? Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom, Christ Jesus the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple or a holy church in the Lord. In whom, once again, you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Paul seems to agree that the apostles and the prophets have laid a foundation upon which God's household is being built. They laid a foundation meaning they, they taught about Christ. The prophets in the Old Testament prophesied about Christ. The, those in the New Testament also prophesied about Christ. And so through their teachings and through their life, they are building a foundation. But they are not the foundation upon which the church is built. They are not at the very bottom. Even under them, there's the cornerstone. And under them is the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. And that is important for us to understand. 
you know, he adds that Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation. In other words, Jesus is the one who holds the foundation that the prophets and the apostles laid down. Without Jesus, their foundation would crumble to the ground. Without Jesus, uh, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, uh, his work of intercession for us right now, without Jesus and his his life without Jesus and the gospel of Jesus, the foundation that all of these people laid down, it would matter not. It would crumble. It would fall. It would make no sense. So we need Jesus as the cornerstone. We need Jesus at the very bottom. He is that rock upon which the building is being built. Now, we need to ask Peter, because if anyone knows what Jesus meant in Matthew, it's Peter himself. I mean, he, he must know something that, that we don't know. I mean, he, he is a, a witness to the words of Jesus. And if Jesus meant that he was the rock, that he was the, the foundation of the church, then surely Peter would have known that and he would have told us and he would have acted as if he was and so we have to go to Peter Peter needs to tell us something here and so let's go and ask Peter let's go to first Peter uh, the first letter of Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 8 Very interesting what Peter tells us here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. And coming to him, coming to Jesus, as to a living stone, Jesus is a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ for this is contained in scripture behold I lay in Zion quoting Isaiah a choice stone a precious cornerstone and he who believes in him will not be disappointed this precious value then is for you who believe but for those who disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Peter here provides a powerful personal testimony that would be hard to refute by anyone. If he taught that Jesus meant that he himself was the rock upon which the church was going to be built, then... Uh, or upon which the church would rest, then he'd surely have said something to us to that effect. However, it's instead Peter speaks of Christ as the living stone, the precious cornerstone, upon which we, all of us who accept Christ, all of us who, who come into his church, all of us who are baptized in into his name all of us like living stones are being built upon him well let me explain a little bit what that means each one of us is part of the edifice of god's church each one of us you see all of us are part of the church and the church is this this spiritual building and it's composed of everyone who has ever accepted Christ and lived by Christ. Every single person who has accepted him has become part of this, this building. That includes you, that includes me. All of us are living stones when we come to the living stone, Jesus Christ. And so all of us uh, are like, like a brick on this building. Each one of us is laid on the foundation of the apostles, first of all, of the prophets, 
but also on the foundation of those who brought you into the church, uh, on their teaching, on their lifestyle, on their example to you. And then those who you bring into the church will be built, you know, upon you and so on and so forth. But if you go down, 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 you go, you know, from, from where you are at and those who brought you in and the next one's down, down, down. Finally, you get to the apostles and you get to the prophets. But at the very bottom, it's not a human like you and me. At the very bottom is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one that holds the whole edifice together. He is the one that holds his church together. He is the sure foundation. He is the cornerstone, the precious cornerstone. He is the one upon which all of us are being built. But we are part of the church. So uh, there we are, you know, tiny little pebble here and there. But it doesn't matter. I don't know if you've uh, ever seen someone or you yourself have uh, made cement before and you've seen people pouring cement. You know, cement is built with, you know, you have your concrete and then you have some gravel and then you have some water and then you mix it up. And from there comes this element that after it hardens, it becomes this just solid, solid thing that it's hard to move, hard to break. Uh, you could say to yourself and others, well, I'm just a little pebble. Well, it doesn't matter if you're just a little pebble. I'm a little pebble too. All of us are little pebbles, but together with the foundation and with the, uh, the, the teachings of the church, and we become stronger together. We bind together. And so the church is composed of all of us. We're in it together. It doesn't matter what color you are, what you know, gender you are, where you're from, uh, what language you speak. All of us are together and we compose this spiritual building. And uh, all of us are important. We, all of us are holding it together, holding each other together, holding each other accountable. But under us, is Jesus Christ. The reason why the church does not collapse, the reason why the church will not collapse, no matter how hard times get, no matter how much uh, you know apostasy may occur within the church, is because Jesus is the foundation of the church. Those who say, oh, the church is Babylon, oh, the church has apostatized, oh, you should leave the church, they forget that Jesus is the foundation of the church. If you leave the church, you leave Jesus. And that's important. The only way that we can stand secure, the only way that we can stand without falling is because Jesus is the foundation. It's because He is the rock. If there's a wind, if there's a hurricane, if there's a tornado, if there are storms, uh, we're not afraid, or we should not be afraid, because we are built upon the rock. We're not built upon sand. If we were built upon Peter, the men, Peter, and the other apostles, we surely have collapsed by now. But because Jesus Christ is the foundation, the church stands firm and the church will continue to stand from now until forever. He, the church will not collapse as long as Jesus is our sure foundation. But let us hear it from Peter once again. Uh, this will be our last text. It's found in Acts. This is soon after, of course, Jesus ascended into heaven. Chapter 4, and verses 8, and then we're going to skip to verses 11 and 12. Notice what it says here in, in verse 8 of Acts chapter 4. It says, Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit when he spoke these words. 
he was not just speaking, you know, whatever came to mind. He was not just, you know, just mumbling things. No, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So what comes next after he is filled with the Holy Spirit, we know that this is God's Word. And this is what comes next. We're going to skip the uh, verses 9 through 10, 9 and 10, but you can read it later. It says, verse 11, He, referring to Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And he tells us this amazing truth. There and there is salvation and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Peter, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, did not testify about himself being the cornerstone. He did not say, I am the rock. He did not say, it's upon me that the church is built. He gave all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, and all the credit to Jesus Christ. Because it's not through... It, Peter is not through Paul, is not through your pastor, is is not through through uh, Abraham, is not through Ellen G. White that we are saved. It is through Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of our church. He is the foundation of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. He is the one that holds us together, who will hold us together until the end. Our only hope, our only help, and the only way to be saved for all of us is to stand firm on Jesus Christ, our sure foundation, our precious cornerstone, the rock of our salvation. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the study this morning. We thank you. For your Holy Spirit we thank you for making clear uh, these difficulties help us to understand them to accept it to believe it to live by it and when the storms of life or when we are going through difficult times times of need times of thirst times of fear may we not look around us may we look to you because you are our rock you are our precious cornerstone. You are our true foundation. The church is built upon you. We are built upon you. We thank you that we have this sure foundation. It definitely fills us with courage to move forward. Help us not to look around us, but help us to rest assured that you are under us, that you have us in your hands that you have our best interest in mind and that we can rely upon you regardless of the circumstances. It is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We thank you once again for having joined our uh, church and worship service this morning here at the Edge Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, we want to remind you once again because we did it on Wednesday that we have a prayer and revival series coming up. When is it coming up, Kara? <laughs> it's coming up in June 26th through the 28th, if I am not mistaken. I'm looking for my Next phone. Friday. But it's the last Friday? Next Friday. Next Friday. Next Friday. And so next Friday, next weekend, we are be going to have this, this prayer and revival uh, weekend. The whole weekend is going to be about prayer and revival. Actually, I have it right here. I just remember. Not that old. So, even better. June 25th through the 27th. There you go. Now I'm giving you the, the right information. Prayer and revival service. Uh, we are going to do it through Zoom. And that is June 25th through the 27th, 2020. Each day will be uh, from 6 p.m. through 7 p.m. 6 p.m. through 7 p.m. There's going to be all kinds of just wonderful participation of our members. Members 
uh, and friends of the church we are going to be having you know praise music we are going to be having prayer of course uh, groups of prayer we are going to be having uh, scripture reading we're going to be having testimonies and uh, and just inspirational talks and so we invite you to join us you, you will find the links on our Facebook page and other pages on our website as well and so please make plans to join us next uh, weekend starting on Thursday and going on from there on and uh, just plan to be with us plan to be with us plan to join yourself in prayer we need prayer all of us need prayer we are we are uh, going to be defeated on some people if we don't pray together remember that when the apostles prayed together that is when the Holy Spirit was poured upon them when they were together in prayer and so it's very important for us as a church to do likewise and so we invite you next next weekend next Thursday to come and pray with us let us experience revival as a church may the Lord bless you the rest of this holy day